have you ever met uh, one of those people that, you know, just by their voice, by their face, by their body language, you knew that this person was truly a special individual. When I first met Demi, as I talked about in the intro, he's got incredible things he has done. His journey has been amazing. But what really stuck out to me about you, Demi, is your authenticity and and your realness. And I just liked you from the very beginning. I have to tell you, um, thank you for being on Crossing the Line today. And and thank you for giving us your time. But I just got, you just got to know, um, I really like you, Demi. You're just a, you're just a truly nice person and, and uh, welcome. Welcome to Crossing the Line. Thank you so much, Dr. Lido. And thank you for your kind words. Um, and I'm super excited about this uh, conversation that I, I'm going to have with you. It was a pleasure to meet you as well. And I can't wait to uh, talk more about some of that, but also learn from this conversation. So thank you for having me. Mm, what a, well, what, what an honor to have you. So, so Demi, we're going to talk, as we do on Crossing the Line, you have graciously agreed to tell us your story, to, to talk about Demi. And, and we believe that we learn from listening and, and hearing the stories of, of leaders, and you are an incredible leader. So let's go back. Let's go back to around, you're around eight years old. Now, now Demi, for our audience, tell us where you are at that age. Tell us you know what what country and all that kind of set it geographically for us but then tell us what was a day in the the life of demi the eight-year-old what was that like that's a that's an interesting question it's not something i think about every day um but i appreciate the opportunity to reflect and when i think about now thinking about where i was at eight years old um right now so just for some context i'm in kigali rwanda um, in East Africa, on the African continent. But at eight years old, I was in Lagos, Nigeria. Uh, my father, my parents, and our entire family had just moved from another city called the Badon in Nigeria and would moved to Lagos. So here we were dealing with uh, that transition. I can remember the vivid memories was from that time was just dealing with that transition. Uh, I think around that time as well, interestingly, my father used to work uh, with uh, a bank. And so we were pretty comfortable. And I think that while he was moving to this new place, uh, to, 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 to Lagos now, he lost his job at the bank. So this was, re this was a really, actually very pivotal movement, moment in the life uh, of myself and my family. And this just changed how things used to be. We used to be super comfortable. And then now we go to Lagos and um, started a new journey that was that was hard in many ways. It was hard because we uh, couldn't access some of the resources that we used to be able to access. But I also remember, I, I'm thinking about how some of that affected me, right? Um, also making this transition into a new environment, into a new school, uh, amongst new people, I struggled a bit with that. Uh, so, it, 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 I mean, it, it was fun to be able to move, but it was also, for my young self, a, a challenging moment. Um, happy to speak more about that, but that's eight years old. I can re that, those are some of the things I can remember, yeah. Okay, so you're eight years old. You're moving. Your dad lost his job. Now, a new environment, a new school. Um, do you have brothers and sisters, or is it just you? I good question. I have. I used to have two elder sisters. One of them passed on, and so I still have an elder sister. And I have three younger brothers. So I'm somewhere around the middle, right? I'm the third one in the family of six. So. Here you are at eight years old, and, and your siblings and yourself are in this new place, this new environment. How did your parents help you? What was it like from their perspective trying to help you adjust to this new environment, new, new limited resources, new lifestyle? How did they deal with that? The, again, like uh, anything that happens to the family is difficult for everybody, and uh, one of them was trying to figure out new streams 
of income to be able to support the family. It was taking very long for my dad to get a new job. I think he was also affected in some way by the way that he lost his job. And so it, uh, I, I think those things happened and it was taking very long while. And so my mom um, was working as a nurse, as a nurse at that time, and she would leave to go work at, at the hospital. But she, she then also started thinking about starting a, a store, a, a grocery store, where that could bring in new income to support the family. And so that was one of the things that uh, my parents did to support us, but it had to be all hands on deck now because I remember we had to take turns manning the grocery store or being involved with um, selling some of the products, right, from the store uh, to, to be able to contribute our quota, to be a part of that. Faith was one of the big support uh, structures. We, we grew up in a church. And so one of the things that we knew to do was to worship and pray and pray about um, all the things that we were going through. Our parents did the very, my parents did their very best to keep us encouraged, to keep us as close knit as possible, even, in, even when we didn't have all the things that we used to have uh, previously. And that was, that was challenging for us. Uh, but then they, they were there to, to support us but, and still do their best to uh, make sure that we got a proper education. So we, at least at that point, could still afford to go to a private school. So you would have, in, in, in interesting thing in Nigeria, it happens that, I don't know, it might not be this way in other parts of the world, but public schools in Nigeria sometimes tend to be worse than private schools because the government is not funding the education as much as it should be. And I know in some parts of the world, government schools are better than many private schools, right? So it's the reverse. Uh, it was a reverse in Lagos. But our parents tried their best to keep us as long as they could in the public school system, because I think the, the private, sorry, in the private school system, rather, they kept us in the private school system, because in the public school system, that affects your psyche even more. Like it's overcrowded many times. It's um, just people that sometimes can afford to send their kids to school. And so they they did that even with very limited resources. And so these family times, shared family conversations around faith, around just keeping the family bonded and ensuring that we were able to stay in school was really helpful around this time. You, you know, Demi, you are, you are articulating what what really we find in leaders across the world and when they look back at their life you you had to work you had to there was hard work involved running that grocery store doing things selling there was faith there was love there was encouragement by your parents those attributes um taught you an awful lot i know as an eight-year-old and 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 a little older but now you're now let's move you up just a bit and you are you're a teenager you're, you're a young man, let's say you're 13, 14, 15. What is life like for Demi at this, at this age? Yeah, I'm trying to go into... <laughs> okay, so I'll now... That. I see Yeah, <laughs> to, to see where I'm at that point in time. But then when I'm 13 and when I'm 14, I my dad along the line started to do some community work. And so he set up a library, a community library, I think one of the things that our sort of downturn in fortunes left with us was empathy um, for people who didn't have access to resources. And I think during that time, my dad felt very drawn, perhaps with his own situation and with the situation that we were going through, felt very drawn to helping other people. And so one of the things that he did then was set up a um, thankfully, things have gradually begun to improve and stabilize, and especially with the continual growth. So my mom had gone to set up a private practice uh, and set up a maternity home, and then the store had grown bigger. And so things were beginning to improve for us. And so my dad set up this community library, and I started to volunteer there as a uh, after-school teacher, helping other kids uh, uh, 
and uh, and just uh, I always say that was my first job because when I finished high school as well, aside from the work that I did in the store, um, it was I, I I got an employment letter from working in that youth center, especially. Um, after high school, before I transitioned to, to university. And so this is what was happening around 13. I'd also just moved into what we call secondary school um, at that point, which was after my, my, my primary school education. Uh, and so secondary school, okay, I still attended a private school in secondary school. But then uh, at some point, I had to move into a public school. Oh, um, yeah. So I moved into a public school, I think, in my third year of high school. Right. Uh, and so that was that was another transition for me because I wasn't used to the public school system. They, in, in many ways, they are miles apart. When you think about it, public schools are are with all kinds of people, all kinds of kids. Like we were raised in a very protective Oh, right. And I'm going into a public school where there's kids from everywhere who um, there's there are cults, people affiliated with cults, uh, uh, people affiliated with all sorts of things and all sorts of behaviors. So it was almost like going into the deep end in that point. And so learning to navigate that uh, without being the one to be picked on as well was something that I was trying to um figure out at that point right yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah it, it was quite a shift for me so when you yeah. went to the public school demi you had to you had to think think through how to not become the victim i guess huh i had to i i had to i was i was a victim a number of times i because i would it, it was when i got into the public school for example you you had to bring your own chair at your desk right? Your parents had to buy your chair and your desk. And every time, I think they had to buy at least three times because it will get stolen. Um, my desk, my new desk, my new desk and chair will get stolen from my classroom. And then I would look all over the school and not be able to find it. And I would have to, um, to, to get another one. Um, at some point, eventually I had to figure out how to make do. I, I'm trying to remember those days now. It's very absurd. It's weird. Um, wow. And uh, I had to, I, I, I think I just figured it out to either sit with a friend or do some makeshift kind of thing because I couldn't tell my parents to keep buying a desk kind of chair for me because it was stolen a lot of the time. And this was common. And I think also at some point I had to figure out how to protect my this can chair as well. So some of that toughening process as well to be able to survive. Yeah, it was survival skills, right? Um, uh, that and many other things in that space was real was real survival skills. Yeah, beginning. Wow, I can't I can't imagine. And it, it it finally got to the point where you said, "I'm not I'm not going to ask mom and dad for another desk and chair. I'm going to make do. I'm going to figure out." And and uh, and how long were you in public school, Demi? How long did that last? It was four years. The public school, high school system is six years. So I spent the, the high school system is six years. I spent two years in the private school and then I was four years in the public school. So did that harden Demi as a teenage boy? Now he's 16, 17, 18 coming into this. He's in four years of the secondary school. Did it in the public school? What did, what did that do to you as a young man? It it um Arden, I think it was also it was also the point where I I started like you know with everything going on around me and with I I didn't have a ton of good friends or good influences in the public school I started to learn some of their ways so for example I would and and again this was I I think it also tapped into another part of me which is like adventurous so. Um, I can remember some of those experiences where we would go out to what we call the jungle, right? For me, it was exploration. There were a lot of things that people were doing then. People would um, go do go do drugs and go do cigarette and sex and all that. But 
I came from a, a home that was steeped in the faith. My dad has a pastoral background, so I, I couldn't do all of that. But still, I would skip class, right? I would skip school because those are the influences around me. And that was some of the things that I began to learn as well. So I think in, especially in the two years, the middle part of that public school, first public school, by the way, um, when it was clear that that public school was being a very bad influence on me, my parents transferred me to another public school. So in that, that first two years of a public school, it was wow. like the jungle, like we call it, we'll go to the jungle and do all that. Um, I would be, I wouldn't be in class with all the other guys. Um, but then I got transferred to another public school, which was moderately much more conducive, right? And, and much so. This, so when you transferred, the environment was much more. Um, it was much more appeasing, easier for you to 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 learn and grow. Is that right? Yeah, it was a lot easier to learn and grow. I had. Um, so there was accountability as well. I think there was a there was a co- there was a teacher or two, a couple of teachers that I could look up to. That my parents, in some way, also um, attached me to to say um, check in with this teacher from time to time, but also uh, gave the teacher some sort of responsibility to look after me or sort of like keep an eye on me so that I will be checking in and I won't stray too far. So that that changed uh, going into this new public school. So here you are, now you're finishing your, your school, um, what we call high school, and you're getting ready for university. Who are you now? You're 18, you're, you're 19, you're this young man. Who, who is Demi at this stage? Yeah, no, no I'm, I, I'm at this stage, I am exploring a lot I, for for the good, right? For the good. I think the in this new public school that I went to, there was I there were more positive influences around me, and it was a space as well where I could also learn and explore. And so I I think I served in some capacity. I can remember volunteering for beginning to serve as a volunteer. But that was also around the time when I started, my dad actually started this youth uh, youth library and youth outreach organization. And I started also working and being a part of, I, I started volunteering. I didn't officially be employed there. I started working there. And so interestingly, I finished public school very well, I finished. Um, I was one of the very few students who had uh, an outstanding result and gained admission to the university right away. Um, university admission rates were very low um, in public schools at that time. Most people had to write their school leaving exams twice um, or three times or multiple times before they could get an admission. But I was able to do that once. And at, so wow. at this stage as well, wow. I'm beginning to learn about different things. I'm I'm beginning to learn a lot more about the power of the internet. And I remember then as well, I'm doing, I, I started a, I'll call it a small business with a friend. And what we used to do then was we used to teach people how to browse the internet. So we would ask people to pay us and then we will go to a cyber cafe. So for example, let me use Nigerian Naira. We would ask people to pay us about 70 naira, and then we'll take them to a cyber cafe and buy 30 minutes of time for 50 naira and teach them how to browse the internet because it was just becoming more accessible via cyber cafes. And so we would make that profit of 20 naira. We'll do the same thing. If people wanted to send emails, we'll facilitate that and put a charge on that. So some of the additional business skills I started learning from doing that um, and so at that place, I'm developing as a young leader, I'm exploring business. And I think uh, my friend and I went on later to publish our first mini magazine, mini magazine. We called it Info Power. And then we started to go around high schools 
to do talks to high school students. So this is between the my this, this is a transition. Uh, there, there was what we call a university strike in, in the university, and so I couldn't get into school even though I had my admission for a year. And so we thought, what could we use this time for? We published InfoPower magazine, and we would go to schools and talk to young people in schools and sell our, our magazine as well at this time in that transition. So this is what was happening at that time. Goodness gracious, what an entrepreneurial spirit, even as a young man. And that's amazing yeah, to me. Congratulations. Yeah. And you who, who knew you were an IT coach before there were IT coaches teaching people how to use the internet. Good for you. Wow. Yeah. Cutting edge. So you went to university yeah. and and um, graduated from university. And then what happens? Take us through to kind of bring us into your adult life. Walk us through from, from there to where you are today. Yeah. So I, I have the entrepreneurial um sort of hunger in me and through university i was launching one product or the other one project or the other i would find the problem and try to solve it one example was where uh, we had this biology class where everybody needed to dissect a toad and because there were people who couldn't catch toads i took it upon myself to go in the night and essentially harvest toads, help them handle it, provide it to them in a can for a fee. <laughs> and so, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so that was that was a business opportunity for me. I made money. I think I wrote a mini book later on where I it was titled "I Made Money Selling Toads." Right? I did that, and then I did some more uh, some more business in school around selling music. Uh, CDs and cassettes and a number of things. And then I did some training businesses where I would host a speaker and workshops. I remember doing one of the final things I did at university was to hold a big uh, agricultural training workshop in my faculty then, which was uh, which was a big thing because it brought a lot of people from outside the university and all that. So I went from that into the next phase when you finish university in Nigeria, you have to do a two-year, sorry, a one-year compulsory youth service program. So it's almost like a teach for America kind of program or a teach for, and so, but I did that. And then I was a teacher in that period of my life as well. But I had the opportunity to help run a training center in the state where I was. And I found quite some success at it. I came with, with a very entrepreneurial approach and mindset. And so I was able to help take that organization out of the current reds they were and, and get some measure of success. And so I was like, you know what? I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna get employed anywhere. I'm just gonna go run my business, right? And so I I spent some years trying to do that, falling, eating my head on the wall, <laughs> struggling a lot with that, you know, and um I had some successes at some point, but there were also a lot of hard knocks. I'm trying to run my business in publishing, advertising, and, uh, and, 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 and brand design, right? I got some successes as well in that. Uh, along those, uh, somewhere along that line where I had some measure of progress, but also some measure of discontent. I started to feel more, because I'd spent like five, six years in advertising, branding, and design, I started to feel like I wanted to be more involved directly with people and to invest in people. And so I started a social enterprise teaching leadership and entrepreneurship to uh, high schools. And so that's where I did some of my mini book publishing. And then I started to, I would use the money for my business to fund a lot of my social enterprise activity because it wasn't super profitable in terms of the services we were offering and some of the training that we were doing. So I did that for a couple of years and somebody got, um, we in some way I found somebody on the internet who was interested in that. And this person felt like I could do that work with an organization in South Africa. And mm. so that was my first connection to traveling outside of my country to actually go do this mentoring for high schoolers. I, I got to work in a program called the Global Scholars Program, 
that would bring scholars from all over the world. And so I worked as a coach and as a mentor in that wow. program. And that, that was my journey into higher education and some of the next steps I took beyond that point. It, it's, a, it's amazing that, Demi, you have accomplished what you have with the heart that you have. What I keep hearing, you know, you had hard knocks, but you didn't allow that to stop you from pursuing your passion. And, and maybe as you look back at your life and you see where you were in that jungle of a public school where, where you had hard knocks, you had to learn to overcome back as an eight year old moving to a new environment and then going to a public school that was difficult and then trying to make your way that you overcame that. But yet at the same time, you have this heart for giving back for teaching high school students about leadership, for having this social awareness and these social enterprises that I can tell uh, are such a passion for you. And I'm so proud of you for giving back. We need leaders like you, Demi. We, we need more Demis in our world today. Can I ask you something? I know our time is fleeting. I want to want to ask you, though, there are other Demis out there. There, there are leaders across the world who, who are young, um, or maybe not so young, but they're trying to find out who they are. They're trying to find out what is their contribution to this world. The what what is it that they they should and maybe they're struggling. Maybe they 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 are in the season of hard knocks. But what would you say? What what would you give me two or three nuggets, if you will, that you would say to these uh, young leaders or to these aspirational leaders? What what would you say to them? The first thing I would say, and I struggled with this for a bit, especially with finding relevance. And the first thing I would say is that their voice matters and that their opinion matters. Um, I think when you come from a place where you are shut down or you are maligned either by um, circumstances or by people, you tend to, and I struggled with this for a while, you tend to believe after a while that you don't have a lot to contribute. But it's not true. There is no single person on earth that does not have something, no matter how little, to contribute. It might be a smile. It might be an hello. It might be an encouragement that they're able to give. So, and that's the starting point. And I think that that blossoms. So if you risk, if you, if you believe and that you understand that you're here for a purpose and that your voice matters, and that you can contribute something no matter how little. That's how it grows, right? Even in those very dark places, believing in that and being able to give something no matter how little is the seed that then allows that to blossom into bigger things. Sometimes we think about bigger things that we want to do, but the purity and the beginning point is just knowing that the little, the, the impact we're able to make no matter how little is powerful. It's a part of the conversation. And I'm saying this as well to say, do not hold back your voice. Even when you feel like you're not perfect, even when you feel like you are not enough, you're actually enough, but do not hold back your voice. The other thing I would say, and it's just very related, is, is, is really just believing, believing in yourself, right? Believing in yourself, because I think that's powerful. Um, once you believe in yourself, you 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 set the tone for other people to do that for you. Sometimes there are very dark places where people need to believe in us first. Um, if you have that opportunity, don't take it for granted. If people tell you they believe in you, that's that's a springboard for you to then go and do more work for yourself. I've had people in my life do that and give that gift to me. And I try to give that gift to as many people as possible. So. But I, I would say this as well, if a young leader and aspiring leader is listening to me, I believe in you like I believe in my students and a lot of the people that I work with, that you have something to offer if you rise up and speak to that. And I think the last thing I would say is experiment. You know, there's tons, there's places in my story where I, I, I didn't get to share the failures in detail um, but there's failures along the journey, as well as successes. And one thing is I've always experimented um, because sometimes you stumble into the place where you are supposed to be. Sometimes there's no clear cut formula. There are guides and frameworks that can help make the journey easier. But the willingness to take action and just experiment, 
And Dr. Lidu, like you said, I've always tried to lean in the direction of my passion. And mm. some people say, I don't know what that passion is. I've always had interest as well, not always passion. So sometimes it's interest that generates into, a, that de de evolves into a passion. And so it's a starting point. So experiment in the area of your interest, of your passion, but with a heart. And if you have that heart that you want to make people's lives better, you want to contribute to people, which is at the core. Like, and I think that's the motivation that you want to make. And I ask myself, even with things that I'm doing today, how are they going to make people's lives better, right? Like whether it's a for-profit thing or it doesn't matter. Does it make people's lives better at the end of the day? So if it does, I feel, you know, I feel energized towards that. And I feel it's worthwhile. And so that's what I would say. Um, and I hope that that is helpful amongst the many things that we could say. Powerful, powerful stuff, Demi. Now, I tell you, you mentioned how important your faith was in your and your upbringing. I think we've just had church, my friend. That was amazing. Thank you for that. That what, what powerful, powerful things. Your voice matters. Believe in yourself. Uh, give give that gift of believing in others. Experiment. Be willing to fail and follow that passion, even if you fail. That is beautiful. Beautifully said, um, Demi. You are amazing. And I want to thank you for sharing some of that amazement with us today. Um, you truly are impacting uh, so many people. And today you have impacted us. And I want to thank you for that. I have to ask one more question. I'm going to let you go. Uh, what's next for Demi? Where, what's on the horizon for you? I am currently working on a number of things. I'm working at the nexus of learning, innovation, employment, and entrepreneurship. And so in the next five weeks, we have what we call the Future of Work and Entrepreneurship Summit, uh, which where we are launching some of the programs we're currently doing, which are employability programs essentially to help young professionals, especially across the continent, develop the skills and connections to thrive in the future of work. And so we have some of those ambitious big things ahead of us in the year where we are, we have um, other programs around supporting institutions and in, in learning innovation uh, and improving how they prepare young people for the world of work. I think that there are gaps in how the, the skill sets that people, especially young people from universities take to the marketplace. And that's a lot of work courses on employment because there are job opportunities, but there are not skilled sufficiently skilled people to take that up so we're trying to we're plugging that gap and creating alternative models to employment so that is manifesting in a book that i'm also releasing um it's called plan b premier in, in in five weeks time there's a platform we're also releasing and i'm saying this forgive me because that's the immediate thing of my mind because that's uh, the, the the tangible thing that we're doing and so across two cities in East Africa, we will have about a thousand young people where we have a day of panel sessions, coaching and master classes, and then we would connect them to pathways for further continuous development, some of which we'll do, but some of which we are bringing other stakeholders on board to work on. So that is in the immediate. Um, our goal is um, by 2030 to have impacted and, and have created opportunities for 1 million young professionals across uh, and young people across Africa and uh, uh, primarily. Wow. Yeah. That's an incredible goal and you will do it because you are amazing following your passion. I'm excited about this, Demi. We will keep, we'll keep connected, won't we? And uh, we'll follow you and Absolutely. support you and your endeavors to impact a million young people by 2030. Wow. What a, what a goal. Thank you for this. You have inspired me. Uh, I love hearing your story. I'm grateful for you in our, in our relationship. And uh, I look forward to us uh, speaking again very, very soon. Thank you, sir. I appreciate this opportunity to reflect and to be able to meet you as well. And I look forward to learning more from you and uh, your experience that you have. But it's been a gift, real gift to me to be able to share today. So thank you.